I am joined today with Mr. Bart Griffith. Thank you very much, Bart, for coming into the podcast. We're doing it virtual, but it's been a long time coming, and it's uh, it's exciting to see you. It's been a couple years since we caught up, so I've been very excited to to reconnect and and hear about your time uh, as the president of Shady Side Academy. Well, thanks, Jake, and it's wonderful to be with you and with the Gilman community, at least virtually. Uh, admire your persistence. You know, this, this has been, uh, like you said, a long time coming, but uh, glad we finally found the opportunity to, to make it work. Sorry I couldn't be there with you in person. All good. We, uh, we've we got the setup here. It feels like you're in the room with this big monitor that, that we have in the in the tech room or the podcast studio. So we're all set and ready to go. Well, um, as, as I like to say, Jake, I'm, I'm a fan of the pod. Um, I have I've been uh, admiring your work through this project uh, from a distance, and um, I'm sure, like many people that you know don't live in Baltimore but want to stay connected to Gilman and everything that's happening there and the life of the community, um, the, the podcast has been a really great opportunity to do so. So I listen to it in the car or when I'm out on walks or whatever else. So uh, thanks again for the service, and uh, it, mean, it means a lot to everyone that, that cares about the school. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Um... Yeah, I think that's one of the coolest things about it is I've gotten a few emails from people that I've never met before, alums, people who are just, you know, finding the podcast somehow online. And I think it's pretty cool to to connect with some people, some some greyhounds out there in the world. So I appreciate you checking it out. Yeah, so Bart, sure. Bart, you're pretty you're pretty active on social media on on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I was just curious about your role as the president of Shady Side and maybe why it's important for you to be online like you are and be active on the social channels. Um, yeah. Because I do know that a lot of heads of schools do have presence online. And I'm just curious about maybe the role of social media for you as you know the head of a, a, of a school. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we've got a really talented communications team here at Shady Side, and when I came on board in the summer of 2019, it, it really was a recommendation that 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 they made, um, and it, it really is the, the root of or the root cause is um, the configuration of Shady Side Academy. So, so we are a multi-campus structure. Um, we, we have uh, four different campuses. We have two lower schools, a middle school and then an upper school. Uh, the, the One of the lower schools and, and the middle school and the upper school are all sort of almost like the, the tri-school, sort of all within about a quarter mile of, of one another, but nonetheless still, you know, a pretty decent walk. Um, and then we have another lower school uh, that's probably six to eight miles from sort of that nexus of the other three campuses. And so visibility for you know, the president of, of Shadyside um, is challenging and, and certainly, you know, in a different way than it is for maybe Henry um, at Gilman, where he walks out of his you know front door and uh, in Cary Hall and, and goes, you know, 20 or 30 yards to the lower school or to the middle school. Um, for me, I have to dedicate essentially a day of the week to head to one of our lower schools. I have to arrange my calendar really intentionally to be present and um, visible on on the other two campuses here um, in, in uh, sort of our suburban uh, uh, stronghold. So um, it was a way for me to be visible and and connect uh, with with the community um, uh, in in such such a fashion that would maybe transcend some of the you know geographic uh, distance and 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 sort of. Um, separation that that's just sort of the nature of our our school and it's been a lot of fun um you know i said i'll do it but i, I want to make sure that i do it in such a way that allows sort of my personality and my connection with with students and and with the community as a whole to to come through so uh, i was really active in the first couple of years i've been taking more and more grief now for um a, a reduced free frequency of posts. So um, maybe in the coming months and, and on the heels of this conversation, I'll be pretty re-inspired to get some fresh content out there. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to keep up. It's like a whole new universe out there that you have to devote time and energy to in addition to all the things that you're doing on a, you know, in a personal face-to-face -face basis as president. But it is cool to see someone who's running a school also have a presence, you know, on the internet too. Well, there are a lot of students I've noticed that 
um, you know, maybe because of the office or just the nature of teenagers, will engage me more directly and more authentically through that online space, you know, whether it's a, a DM message or, or a comment on a post of mine, then they will in, in person. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, not that that's something that um, I would celebrate, but I think it's a reality of how a lot of kids, you know, um, engage and, and in particular um, engage me at this, at this moment. Um, the, the handle for my Instagram account is SSA Prez and a lot of the students instead of referring to me or calling me Mr. Griffith, will see me on campus and you know, say SSA Prez, you know, or whatever, <laughs> um, just as a result of the, the Instagram uh, post. So, um, you know, it, it is what it is. And um, I, I try to keep it all in balance and all yeah. of that. But it's been a sort of a fun tool to play with. Um, and I learn more and more about it every, every, every with every post. Yeah, I think that's something that I notice sometimes in my classroom, too. Sometimes having a conversation in person and going from student to student like I'm kind of used to, it doesn't go the way you want. People are shy in the room. People don't want to share. But some of the tools that I actually learned through the Penn Fellowship Program, like the, the Canvas discussion board, for instance, where you throw up a question on there and then the students engage with each other digitally, they have so much to say and so many awesome ideas that maybe they're not willing to sh share vocally in class, but through the computer screen, they're very, you know, very willing to do that. And it's just, it's kind of interesting. It is a reality of the time that we're living in. I, I, can, I can remember you know, when I was teaching a lot of English, particularly when um, those technologies became more, more in vogue, um, it would have been very hard for me to guess uh, what students posted what content, um, just based on how they interact sort of in a, a, an in-person sort of live you know, verbal discussion. Um, and uh, that, that, that was really telling, you know, for, for me uh, at the time. And you're right. The, uh, and it, I think it sort of speaks to some of our bias in schools uh, for those sort of extra extroverted kids. We sometimes sort of privilege uh, their participation or, or um, you know, understand or interpret them in, in ways that are probably uh, more favorable than we might the more introverted kids at a, at a Harkness table or, or in a, in a class discussion. So, so Bart, where did you kind of get your start in education? I mean, kind of going back to your time, maybe at Shadyside Academy, you had a great experience there, uh, maybe in your upbringing, but what led you to want to enter the field of education in the first place? And this might be something that has to do with a lot of different avenues that you took growing up, but why do you think you decided on that route? Well, ha having listened to, to the pod now for a couple of years, I, I'll, I'll offer something that I think is probably a, a running theme, at least as I've heard it with uh, many of the teachers you're, you've interviewed. Um, it all started with summer camp for me, um, quite, quite frankly. Uh, my, my parents have a, a small lake cottage in Chautauqua, New York, um, which is in western New York, a little bit west of, of Buffalo, um, on a lake that's a, about 20 miles long. And, and there was a day camp, not an overnight camp, but, but a day camp that I started going to um, sort of fifth grade all the way through maybe my sophomore year of, of high school. Uh, number one, I loved the counselors that were there. Um, they were you know, always about four or five years uh, older than me, but you know, high school or early college age um, people. And, and they, uh, it engaged me in a different way that than I'd ever been engaged maybe by my elementary or, or middle school teachers, you know, in the schoolhouse. Um, so I, I got this sense that being a counselor was really very important. And then when I was 16, I became a counselor uh, at, at the camp and for the first time had that experience of, um, you know, the power that goes along with being in a role like that, but also um, the, the potential that you have to influence and and shape and and inspire young people even if it's a summer camp um, where the context is swimming and kickball and uh you know ravine um capture the flag or whatever else uh, th those were really powerful foundations and um i think for the first time got me thinking about a life in school and then um that was only reinforced sort of during my final years at shadyside as a student um, we are uh, partially a boarding school um at the time, a five-day boarding school, sort of similar to McDonough. Um, and so there were a number of faculty that lived on campus. 
uh, with their families, sort of just like you have it at Gilman. Um, and there was a teacher coach sort of model. And I looked at that lifestyle as a student at 17 or 18 years old and, and, and understood it as uh, highly desirable and, and the kind of life that I wanted to lead. Um, you know, I was a little bit like the, the boy in that movie, um, Rushmore, uh, maybe a little bit more focused, but I wanted to do everything. And uh, my interview answer to this question sometimes is I, I liked prep school so much that I wanted to do it for a living <laughs> uh, and really never wanted it to end. And um, so from that perspective, I got, um, you know, a start in independent schools right out of uh, graduate school. There was a time where I felt like um, as I was coming out of college that uh, I would be really focused on urban education. And I would always been interested in the role that education has to play in um, promoting democracy and, and equity. And, and so I spent um, a year at uh, Columbia doing a, a master's degree, um, M an MAT degree, and uh, taught sort of through some student teaching um, programs connected to that um, graduate school in New York City public, public schools, um, which again was really formative and, and only reinforced my uh, desire to teach and, and to, to approach teaching um, from the perspective of you know, its importance to uh, democracy and, and um, all we can be as a country and world. Love it. Uh, so w when I came to Gilman, you were the first person I met. And I always tell people that I had a pretty nice entry into teaching because it wasn't like, here's a textbook, go teach your class. And you know, like a lot of people get thrown into the deep end with teaching. They just show up day one and you got to figure it out. And for, in some ways, that's a good way to learn. But I had a very excellent program that I started and I had great mentorship between you and Brian Ledyard and, and some of the other teachers here at Gilman, uh, department head Patrick Hastings. I mean, I, I had a very cushioned entry into the world of education. Um, when you started, did you have a similar experience where you had mentorship, had figures that taught you how to teach, or were you thrown into the classroom and kind of had to figure it out on your own? I don't know that I had the, the exact same experience you have. I mean, I, I've been uh, envious of the Penn Fellows for, for some time now. I mean, that really is a, a tremendous supportive resource um, and, and springboard from which to start a, a career in, in the classroom. Uh, but but I will say that the the year that I spent at, at Teachers College uh, Columbia was was really valuable in that it it fostered a sense of intentionality and um, developed a, um, a, a an evolving philosophy of, of education that I don't think I would have entered into the work um, very well without. So in other words, you spend part of that year reading. You know Dewey and and people like that and all that they sort of saw um, undergirding education and its and its value. Um, I read a ton about sort of pedagogy related to the the teaching of of English and and language arts and you know sort of schooled in reader response criticism and and new criticism and all the different ways that um, we we approach. Uh, literature. And, um, you know, I, I think, again, as a 23, 24 year old, it was really important to have that foundation and, um, and a sort of level of forethought and, and research um, sort of behind my initial days in, in the classroom. Um, not that that solved everything. I mean, I certainly faced a lot of challenges and made a ton of mistakes um, early on uh, that, that I learned much from. But um, I, I would definitely argue for um, uh, young and, and early career teachers to do all they can to avoid the sort of sink or swim um, uh, approach that I think a lot of American schools and school systems take. Um, I, I had a lot of colleagues at my first school, Westminster, that you know essentially said that their initial guidance was, you know, here, here, are the, here are the books. Mm -hmm. um, good luck. And um, Many of those people became excellent classroom teachers, but uh, but I think um, my foundation definitely facilitated that. But um, the work that you know we were able to to design and the, the model that was built, um, and I'm sure it continues to evolve through the the Penn Fellowship and and the residency there, um, is is really the Rolls Rolls Royce. So hopefully that's something 
um, that can be replicated and um, continue to be scaled in American education. I know that's part of Penn's motivation um, in doing that, uh, the belief being that at independent schools, they can get things up and running and learn from them, you know, a lot more quickly than they might be able to in some of the, you know, bureaucracies that uh, are at the heart of a lot of the, the public system. Now, I assume at Shadyside, there's a similar point of entry for early teachers or some kind type of program or mentorship model where they get support and guidance as they start their careers. What does that look like at Shadyside? Uh, so we have a new teacher cohort um, at Shadyside that, that goes through sort of initial um, induction um, and, and onboarding experience in the summer uh, prior to the start of their year. Um, and then they have a, a monthly uh, re reconvening um, for a couple of hours, and, and each of those convenings are dedicated to a lot of the same sort of research topics that that you get to ex you were exposed to, you know, through the Penn Penn program. Um, whether it be about um, you know child development, uh, equity and inclusion work, um, cognitive science, you know, all all of that. Um, sometimes that information is presented by you know outside experts uh, that that shady side retains the the services of sometimes that's sort of shared just by folks you know here at the academy that have a unique expertise or, or knowledge base um but you know we don't really have um at this point um the same kind of fellowship uh, model that um, gilman has had historically or um sort of again the, the sort of rolls royce that's evolved there in in relationship to to penn um i think Sort of strategically looking out, um, that's going to be a priority uh, for us moving forward. You know, I, I had the unique <laughs> and sort of challenging opportunity of coming on here uh, just six months before COVID. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of you know sort of longer term uh, objectives, particularly ones that are sort of softer in nature and and sort of more people oriented and, and nuanced, um, you know, weren't really. Um, you know, priorities uh, sort of during, you know, the, the book haven't been priorities sort of in the bulk of my tenure, which um, has been, you know, more uh, dedicated to sort of extended crisis management. But, yeah. um, you know, I now, I, I now think we're sort of six months out of that. Um, and it's been really nice to see um, conversations at Shadyside sort of at a faculty level, at a governance level, um, you know, rededicated to teaching and learning and and um, you know how we how we best inspire kids to make the most of their opportunity here and best equip them to manage and lead in a in an evolving evolving world which is you know um, changing at such a rapid pace I'm, I'm sure there's chatter at Gilman right now about the you know chat GPT um, artificial intelligence that's now kind of entered uh, the the um, society and mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's just the beginning now, have you thought, so I want to talk about ChatGPT, but but maybe we can start um, with just how leadership, I wanted to talk to you a lot about leadership today, but maybe how your leadership style was tested when you became president of Shadyside and all of a sudden there's this massive crisis with a lot of unpredictable variables and unknowns and now you're the leader of this community you obviously attended Shady Side, but it was also a return and maybe a new face for a lot of the faculty members there. How did you get through that, and maybe what do you what do you learn about leadership along that 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 journey? I guess mini journey. I, I, yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a great question. I've reflected a lot on it. I you know being you know largely a, a product professionally of independent schools, um, you know from my perspective as a faculty member, you know, early on in my career and, and through my, my mid career, um, I think privileged and learned to value from, you know, my leadership, a, a really delegative and, and participatory model, you know, that, that as best as possible can be consensus driven. And so, you know, a lot of my gut instincts um, and, and practice um, sort of comes out of that foundation. Uh, the pandemic, you know, overturned that in, entirely in that um, the, the rate of decision making that was necessary um, as we were sort of in the, the fog of war, um, trying to figure out the best path forward was just really um, quite impossible. And there wasn't, um, 
a complete enough set of facts or um, you know bodies of information from which to have really an educated consensus oriented conversation in the first place. Um, and so I, I think more than anything else, you know, have learned that um, while a, a, a delegative and participatory approach um, is still, I think, at the, the core of who I am as a leader, there are those moments. Um, and sometimes it's a heightened crisis like the pandemic, but sometimes it's just something that occurs in the day to day um, where there does have to be you know, an authoritative uh, approach mm -hmm. um, in which, you know, you're going to, yes, here are some people, but you might make a decision that goes against, you know, the majority of, um, you know, your, your faculty or, or, or your community. I mean, as I look back to the summer of 2020, if we had run a survey or a vote in my faculty about whether or not we'd go back to school um, on any frequency in person, um, you know, I think it would have been, you know, a, a vast majority that would have said, no, 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 let's stay remote. Um, and I listened to medical professionals, you know, here in Pittsburgh and beyond. Um, we did a lot of work uh, over the summer to be as informed as we can uh, or could ab about the latest research. And, you know, I had a number of infectious disease specialists, one of whom is my brother who works over at Hopkins in that capacity. I think you can do this. You know, you, you've got to be able to meet the CDC expectations, which we worked hard to be able to do. But um, you can do this, and and so uh, we again went uh, sort of the um, untrodden path, and we were sort of the first independent school to kind of lean out and say we're going to go back to school in person. And in the late summer, we started talking about every child every day. And, um, you know, that was something that, in retrospect, it was a little bit of a, a gamble for sure, but it was a gamble that pay, paid off. And, and our kids got, I think, a, a more quality experience during that school year than, you know, many of their independent school peer students and certainly a lot of the public schools in this, in this area. Um, we were able to have more days in person for more kids than, than any school in Western Pennsylvania. And so we're really proud of that, but it would not have probably happened um, had I approached the scenario out of kind of my sort of, you know, um, foundational approaches in leadership, which are you know, pretty consensus driven. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I think it taught a valuable lesson about context and, and situation and those moments where you might have to veer left or right from you know, some of those found foundational elements that usually are about, you know, a, a more sort of normal, um, you know, pace of, of decision making. Wow. Yeah. I mean, definitely helpful having your, your brother in your ear too, but also just as a, as a new leader at a school, leaning on the community, having conversations with a variety of different people, gathering all the information. I mean, I think, I think as a, as a world, we learned a lot about, uh, the value of community and really the value of school because, you know, I think in addition to teachers, a lot of the professions and the jobs that are maybe sometimes taken for granted were the most important jobs out there that couldn't go remote, really. I mean, we tried, we did Zoom, we had class online, but it just was not, was not the same as it is when you're actually in the classroom interacting with people, building a community, the type of community that you're talking about. Yeah, and I think that's benefit that will continue uh, sort of to deliver and, um, you know, sort of have have rewards for kids years into the future. Because, you know, the gaps um, that, that many kids are, are, you know, still looking to close uh, that, that emerge from that time away, uh, I mean, that, that sets up sort of um, long-term, you know, sequencing challenges for, for a lot of kids uh, years in the future. So it wasn't perfect. Uh, we didn't get everything right, um, and 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 certainly I would approach you know a, a number of different initiatives differently, um, in in retrospect. But uh, you know, proud of of trusting our collective gut or my my gut about about the way we move forward. But I, I think it's also important though to note that I was sort of cloaked in some privilege and maybe survived um, with a level of um trust that might not have been afforded someone that wasn't an alum of the school 
uh, you know, didn't have a, a depth of relationship with the institution that, that, that I had. Um, if I were a head of a new head of school at a independent school in St. Louis or, or Minneapolis or wherever else, not really a known entity, I, I think the scrutiny um, could have been so overbearing that you know my decision making you know never would have been trusted enough to have an impact in, in the classroom. So I acknowledge that um, fully and and understand that. Um, you know, my own biography and connection to the school um, went went a long, long way in um, you know, sort of road grading uh, some of that some of that decision making. And I hadn't made any mistakes yet either uh, yeah. because I was brand new. And so there wasn't a track record of saying, oh, here we go again. And, and so there was sort of a little bit of an inherent trust just just built into where I was in my tenure or at least if not trust, uh, let's give them a chance. Yeah. Familiarity. Let's give them a chance some trust from people that you knew. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so now that we're hopefully beyond that point in history of COVID-19 and you're operating as as normal at the, at the school, what are some of the things that are maybe taking up your your time and your energy and your mind at this point in your, in your tenure as president? Uh, thank you for asking. I mean, I think um, – all of these institutions at their heart are really about people. Um, and I used to say this at Gilman, you know, we're in a who business. And, and so in terms of you know, top of mind um, priorities for me, it, it's always about, you know, how do we uh, better express value um, for the, the people that are brave enough to take on the teaching profession and those that support as staff members, um, all, all that happens in our, our classrooms at Shadyside. Um, and you know that value gets expressed in in different ways um, to to produce morale. Certainly, salary is a part of that. Certainly, benefits are a part of that. Certainly, a professional development um, plan that allows for longer term growth um, without making everybody so sort of fearful that they're you know they're they're uh, um, you know going to have their you know job held over them I mean, you got you got to create models that allow for both both evaluation and growth to, to coexist so um you know that's something that's that's really much, uh, top of mind certainly i think even more so given in the pandemic and and the impact that it's had on i think people's workplace expectations um people's workplace experience it's it's evolving and so um, you know, we're re really doing all we can to, to pay attention to what makes for a quality work experience in 2022. Um, you know, certainly accessibility um, is a priority for us. Um, we at the sort of front end of my tenure were lucky enough to receive a, a gift that was the largest in the history of the school um, in support of financial aid. Um, and, and so we're continuing to kind of model that gift out and make sure that we maximize it so that um, it, you know, benefits the greatest number of, of kids possible and that it inspires others um, to sort of understand the, the value of financial assistance, um, how important it is to make sure that um, independent schools, which, you know, have through a lot of their history sort of been designed for, um, you know, the the the, the the most affluent um you know become something that that kids from all socioeconomic backgrounds can can better enjoy and then um from a capital projects perspective uh shady side's a 140 year old school um and 75 percent of our buildings are 75 years or older uh and so um any head or president of this school um has to be thinking in the long term um, about sort of deferred, you know, capital maintenance, um, how to best deal with old buildings, um, and uh, how to make good decisions that you know lead to a more sustainable physical plant um, at at the school. And um, more than anything else, at the moment, that's sort of the albatross, you know, hanging over, over the neck of of the school. And um, there's tremendous opportunity there, and and we've had some great wins on that front. And I think we've developed some really sound principles uh, as it relates to how we're going to, um, you know, master plan into the future, and and um, in, in ways that are efficient and and maximize, um, you know, our our resources. But um, you know, Gilman is fortunate in that a lot of its primary buildings are relatively new, um, and and Carey Hall. 
um, was recently renovated. Um, and, and so that buys it, you know, another 50 or so years, but you have a fairly new middle school and a fairly new lower school. Uh, one of our two lower schools uh, was a mansion um, built in 1882. Um, and the other was, uh, is all, the, the middle school is also a former mansion that's been sort of um, added upon and expanded, but you know, I, I think was built in you know, 1905 or 1910 or something like that. And so the future of those two facilities um, you know, are, are really top of mind um, for, for the moment for me and, and certainly my board of trustees and a lot of faculty conversation about it as well. Love it. Wow. I'm sure those those buildings are beautiful, but yeah, definitely need to have conversations about the future. Um, awesome. That sounds good. Uh, so, so Bart, I was thinking a lot. I wanted to talk to you about bread loaf. I did my first summer at bread loaf, um, this past summer, and I'm really excited to go back. Vermont is a special place and I, and I got a lot out of the classes that I took, the professors that I had. I know that you watched one of the, the podcasts with, who was it? Brian Wolf, maybe. Yep. Brian Wolf, I'm, I'm actually going to see him this weekend. I'm going up to Yale for a Model UN conference, and we're going to get lunch, and I think I'm going to get a tour of the Yale Art Museum, which no better person to do it with than Brian Wolf. Um, but I'd love to just hear about your experience at Breadloaf and, and maybe about how that program and maybe the humanities has influenced your role as a school leader. I look around at a lot of heads of schools across the country, and a lot of them – some of them went to bread loaf, sure, but a lot of them are humanities teachers in their previous lives, I guess, in the previous role at, at, at certain schools. And I'd love to hear a little bit about how humanities and maybe bread loaf and the, and the type of curriculum that you learned and taught uh, during most of your career has impacted you now that you're president at Shadyside. You're probably familiar with the comedian John Mulaney. I do know. I know who that is. Yeah. I'm sure Chesare does he, too. He's got this line um, where he says, yeah, I think he went to Georgetown and he says, you know, I spent a hundred thousand dollars or my parents spent a hundred thousand um, dollars to be an English major and be assigned books. I didn't read. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I did a little better than John Mulaney in college, but probably not profoundly better. Uh, than, than he did. And so I, I think there was something about going to bread loaf, um, you know, when my frontal lobe had fully dropped um, in my mid 20s that allowed me to make more of um, an engagement with great literature than I was able to sort of with all the distraction that's a part of high school and, and, and college life. There was just a maturity um, that I think helped me to value that experience. Um, have deeper engagement um, in, in the classroom, but uh, to really invest almost all my time, um, you know, but for the evenings, uh, hold up in a, a library somewhere, either on the top of Breadloaf Mountain or, or down at Middlebury College with a book and a highlighter and a, a notebook. And, um, you know, you, you'd be there and six hours would go by um, and you don't even realize it because you're you're so immersed in whatever narrative or, or criticism that you're reading. Uh, at the time. So I just valued the, the opportunity to have six to eight weeks over the summer as an adult, semi-mature person mm -hmm. um, to engage in something um, that had maybe no practical application in the world, but but would feed, you know, my my soul and, and my development as a, as a thinker and, and human being. Uh, I think the other benefit of, of Breadloaf, for sure, one of the other primary benefits of Breadloaf is just the exposure to um, some of the nation's, you know, leading uh, professors and, and experts in the space and just how informal the relationship, sort of much like a prep school, um, you know, the, 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 the students um, uh, can, can, can have with, you know, people like a, a Paul Muldoon, um, you know, here's arguably the greatest um, living English language poet um, that, that we have at the moment. And, uh, you know, you're sitting next to him at lunch uh, mm -hmm. talking about the Yankees or whatever else it is. Um, those kind of interactions were, were really valuable. Um, it, it's really an all-star all -star faculty. Um, you know, I, I found myself uh, drinking a beer one night 
um, you know, within two or three feet and actually having conversation with Seamus Heaney and Paul Muldoon. Like, it's just like, what, what, you know, yeah. how does this, they're, they're talking to me and, you know, interested in, you know, what I have to say about, you know, whatever poetry reading, you know, we just came from. So uh, that was really remarkable. And then I, I also just love the, um, you know, it really is a wonderful affinity space for, you know, high school and middle school English teachers and, um, I, I didn't have sort of in those early days of teaching, I was working so hard uh, um, during the school year. I never really had, um, you know, a rich social life beyond the schoolhouse. And um, some of my most lasting adult friendships have come out of those summers, you know, in Vermont or at Oxford um, with, with bread loafers, a lot of whom are in independent schools and a lot of whom I, you know, continue to cross paths with, um, you know, in my life as, as a head of school. And, um, you know, I, I actually hired... Uh, here at Shadyside, ahead of senior school, um, Trixie Sabandayo, uh, two years ago, who was a, a schoolmate of mine at Breadloaf, and her husband, uh, Josh Frechette, is our associate um, director of athletics, and he also was in that same class, and they met each other uh, hmm. at, at Breadloaf. So, um, you know, it continues to pay uh, important dividends in my life. And I would just say, lastly, um, in terms of its practical application to the work that I do as a head of school, um, I really grew as a writer uh, over the course of those five years, largely because I dedicated real time um, to the craft of it and cared deeply about it. But I had tremendous feedback. And though I was largely writing literary essays, there was something that all of that facilitated that I think has made me a better writer and communicator, you know, certainly in my teaching life, but now as a head of school where you probably see this with Henry. I mean, a, a good part of that job is what you put on paper in response to critical events and moments in the life of the school. And um, I, I feel like I've done that largely pretty effectively. I've made some mistakes, but largely pretty effectively. And I, I credit Breadloaf with a lot of that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point about being being an adult and just having the rare opportunity to you know, sit in a chair for six, seven weeks in the summer, beautiful weather, middle of Vermont, and just read great works of literature and write on your own. I mean, it's just, it's even more uh, valuable, I think, than, than the college experience, at least for me, because I was so busy. My hands were in so many different things in college that when I'm at Breadloaf, it's the only thing you have to do is just read this book and come to class the next day to talk to brilliant people about it. I mean, it's it's a very rare and pretty amazing experience. Or, or if it's Brian Wolf, maybe um, stare at a painting right. for, for 20 minutes, right? I mean, I, I think that was uh, incredible. He was without you know question one of the most influential teachers that I had there, largely because of the sort of interdisciplinary element that he brought to the study of literature with you know his expertise in, in art history. Um, the first day of his class, it was entitled uh, the, the the course um, "Civilization and Its Discontents," which was a, you know play on the the Freud, um, and he uh, showed us a painting called Watson and, and the Shark. Yep, yep. Uh, I saw that. Top. I saw that in and person a couple weeks ago in D.C. It's pretty cool. It's it's incredible, and from that image, and it was a lecture with some you know interaction and Q and A, but from that image, which is in part a simple image, but also a, a complex one. He basically, you know, communicated um, really resonant truths about almost everything we grapple with in American society and civilization, you know, even then, whenever it was 2003, 2004, it's like, oh my goodness, that's right. And it seems totally legitimate. You're right. This, this image is the key to understanding America. <laughs> um, and, and I felt that way with him after 90, 90 minutes, um, you know, at a depth that I, I don't know that I've experienced uh, since then. So um, uh, and, and as a teacher, I as a result of that class, uh, continued to always try to, to make art and, and um, you know, really compelling imagery a, a part of a lot of what I did um, in, in the, the teaching of literature. Yeah, it's a really good point. I remember that he did the same thing in our class this summer where he pointed out, here's the here's the id, here's the ego, here's the super ego, the different layers of the painting. And it's just, I mean, he's he's mind-blowing, partly because he's so passionate about what he's talking about. I mean, he's up there and he's so, he's so into it and it t totally rubs off. 
Um, and it makes you realize what a good teacher is. Somebody who just cares so much about what they're talking about is really into it would would do this all day long if they could. I mean, I remember doing the podcast with them a few months ago and I could have talked to that guy all day because he was it just it just rubs off on you. Well, Henry Smythe always talked about, you know, as we discussed teaching and you know, what we wanted for Gilman, um, authenticity. Uh that 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 for for Henry and I think for, you know, certainly me um is a you know, primary character trait in the classroom. There, there are a lot of different approaches and um, pedagogies that can be effective um, if kids understand that that the way the teacher is um, engaging them is is authentic to, to who they are, and that there's not a pretense or um, you know an effort to be something you know other than what's at the core of that that adult's being. So I was looking at the website for Shady Side a little bit and looking at some of the core values and, and things that you practice there that reminded me a lot of of Gilman's, uh, the Gilman Five here. Um, but that leads me to a question about what you and the school really looks to develop in, in the boys and the girls there in terms of character and what you hope that they graduate with and go out into the world with. Yeah, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to research that, Jake. Uh, it, it's actually pretty funny. I've thought about this a lot. So Shady Side has five guiding principles um, that, you know, uh, echo or reflect a lot of what's represented in the Gilman Five. So, so Shady Side's Gilman principles are, uh, Gilman principles, but for, for the instance, um, guiding principles are uh, kindness, honesty, respect, responsibility, and safety. Um, and there's a lot of thought or there was a lot of thought historically into the sequencing of that. We talk about kindness um, sort of more uh, probably than any of those other values. Um, it's sort of the, the lead for us. Uh, Pittsburgh is the city of um, Fred Rogers, and certainly that's kind of his legacy civically in, in town. And um, I think it's had a lot of influence, not just on Shadyside, but, but organizations um, across the city of Pittsburgh. Um, I, I think that you know any success or any endeavor of meaning for, for children, um, certainly while they're here in school and, and into their adult life, uh, begins with, you know, their capacity for, for, for kindness um, and, and to treat others with uh, compassion, um, with a face of humility, um, and, you know, uh, an effort to kind of understand uh, the challenge that, that someone else is uh, in, in, you know, wrestling with, grappling with, in, in, engaged in. And, um, so, you know, if you were to pop into one of our lower school assemblies or, um, you know, any of the character education initiatives that are built around our guiding principles, they're all um, really valuable. But the one that seems to land best with our kids and, and our families is you know, certainly the, the value of, of kindness. And I don't I don't think kindness is on the Gil is one of the Gilman five, if I remember correctly. It's not. Um, but it is interesting that you say that because the course that you taught here when you were here, at least when we overlapped, was leadership and character and literature. And when you left, I adopted that course and I changed some things around and kind of made it my own over the last couple of years. And, you know, we study we study great historical leaders. We read Man's Search for Meaning. We read this year When Breath Becomes Air. Really uh, meaningful and moving texts. And... On the last day of class, I always feel like I have to give my crew of seniors one last parting word of advice as they go on to semester two and college and the rest of their life. And the thing that I always come back to at the end on the last day is just to be kind. And that's the that's usually the message. Um, and this year I showed actually a commencement speech by one of my favorite American writers living today is. Uh, George Saunders from Syracuse, short story writer. He wrote Lincoln and the Bardo recently, and I think he just came out with a new book. But in 20, I want to say 2013, he did a commencement speech at Syracuse where his words of advice for all of the seniors graduating from his school was just to be kind. And I think that's, I think that's really important for a school to, to value and to, to instill in in students. Yeah, I, I agree, Jake. I mean, you can never be wrong approaching a situation leading with kindness. 
Um, and we face a lot of complex scenarios in organizations like Gilman and Shadyside and, and certainly, um, you know, in offices like mine. And um, I've, I've found they're almost all softened or at least, um, you know, better minimized um, sort of just through uh, an effort to be, you know, compassionate and to err uh, on the sign of kindness. And, and oftentimes that involves perhaps um, extending kindness to someone who, based on their behavior, you know, could arguably not deserve it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I think leading with that always, always makes, um, always makes a difference. And, and certainly also, again, when you're the head of school, um, if, if you approach someone with edge um, or, or with a sharpness, um, that gets received you know, 10x just based on, you know, the, your title. And, and so I'm always reminding myself of that. Um, and uh, again, doing whatever I can to, to live out that that guiding principle of, of the school. Um, always hard. We're all human. But um, yeah, there's but, a go ahead. No, no, please. There's there's a quote that I never really thought much of until I started teaching for a couple of years. And it's something about you're not going to remember what somebody told you or, you know, something else, but you're going to remember how they made you feel. And I think that as a teacher and a person in a community is, is really a, a lot to what you're saying about kindness is you're, you're not going to remember a lot as, you know, from my class or from our daily interactions or whatever, but you're going to remember how you maybe feel when you interacted with me. And I think that's really important to keep in mind in a community like, like ours. Yeah, I, um, I appreciate you saying that. I'm so glad to hear that you uh, continued the, the the leadership course. I, I'm sure that you know putting your own spin on it, you made it an even better experience for for the students. Um, and there was a ton of leadership theory that you know I included in that course just to kind of provide some structure and and some good good frameworks for looking into the narratives and and literature that we're reading. But um, there is a simplicity sort of as you sort of suggest in you know your parting words to your students that be kind um and uh, a lot will follow I, th I think the other thing too that i learned through that course um and some of this was initially theory based is like when we think about leaders and leadership we, we tend to put a lot of emphasis on that person um as an individual we don't often think about the context or um sort of the the condition um or, or circumstances that are affecting the followers uh, at that moment. And there are a lot of scenarios where leaders probably can't ever be successful just because of where the followers happen to be. Um, and there are a lot of leaders that are probably celebrated um, for you know, their accomplishments or, or their organization or community's accomplishments um, when, when really there's probably undue credit to the quality of you know the followership um, and 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 the the brilliance or resilience, whatever it happens to be, of that you know community responding to the leader or um, you know and enhancing whatever the, the leader has initially brought brought to bear. And I, I think about that a ton too, and thought about it a lot through COVID. Yeah, it's interesting. I think when I first started teaching the class, I was trying to find a definition for a leader, or come up with the perfect examples for figures to study who are leaders historically or currently. And I, I learned more and more through teaching the class that there's not one image or characteristic that embodies what a leader should be or is. I think it's a lot of different aspects and there are different types of leaders out there. I mean, I, I I use one of my good friends who was on my team in college as an example. And this guy never played really. He was, you know, he was good enough to play. He just never got on the field. He uh, wasn't the biggest, strongest guy out there. He wasn't the most skilled guy out there, but he was the most positive, energetic person in the locker room you've ever seen. And even when he was, you know, last on the bench or not getting what he deserved or had every right to be, you know, complaining. He was positive and he, he lifted the entire boat of the team in a way that captains didn't and senior leaders didn't. And he, this is part of his makeup and his personality. And 
when I think about leadership, he's he's a person that I would say is a leader that a lot of people maybe wouldn't. Yeah, I think those, yeah, the the uh, critical term for that is you know informal, you know, leadership, right? I mean, I, I think um, sometimes within that follower group, you know, so the 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 lack of a title or or formal designation um, can can create a sort of um, momentum and and level of influence that you know somebody with a title probably is is more limited in. Awesome. Well, well, Bart, uh, one thing that we have done on the podcast that you might have seen is we, we usually do a book recommendation. So something that you've read recently or in your life that has made an impact on you. And I'm curious what you decided to to bring in here. Yeah, I, lo- I love this question. And I've, I've really enjoyed, um, you know, seeing what, what various people on, on the pod have, uh, have put forward. You know, I, I want to certainly um, speaking to a boys school audience um, to think a little bit about my own sort of adolescent development as a reader and uh, a, a book that sort of maybe was a part of uh, my development um, as a reader and, and thinker. Um, I was very young uh, for my class at, at Shadyside. Uh, I think I was the youngest boy um, at, at the time. Uh, and I developed even later than that um, and, 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 and really sort of struggled early on um, in, in the classroom and on ball fields, uh, socially, et cetera. Um, I came new to the school in sixth grade. And, and so, um, you know, my middle school experience was what, not really one that fostered um, an engagement with the written word or, or uh, reading because a lot of it was just moving too fast for me. Um, but I was a hoops junkie. Uh, at the time. And I, I had season tickets to pit basketball with my dad, who was a, a, an academic uh, at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, that was sort of at the height of the Big East um, conference. And so I, I, I just became sort of a hoops junkie. And that occupied a lot of my bandwidth in sixth and seventh grade. And um, somebody that my father knew really well um, recommended to me a book that was about 10 years old at the time called Heaven is a Playground. Hmm. And it's written by a, a sports writer who's still pretty well known, wrote for SI for a long time, Rick Talander, um, Northwestern grad. And uh, he, sort of before he was known as a journalist, um, spent a summer uh, living in Brooklyn um, playing playground basketball. And he had had a largely suburban and, and rural uh, existence. And he, um, you know, brought his notebook with him and uh, his, um, you know, open mind and just spent the summer sort of chronicling his, the relationships that he developed on um, playground courts in Brooklyn, um, some of the culture of uh, playground basketball in New York City. And um, he, he got to know uh, Bernard King, um, who then became later on a, a legend with the, the New York Knicks uh, as a teenager, just sort of playing um, on those courts and sort of immersed himself into that environment. And um, so, so for me, it, it was, uh, you know, certainly not high literature. It's never going to be a part of, you know, the canon alongside Hamlet. Um, but it was written with an attention to craft and storytelling that in my little seventh grade brain, I think brought me into the world of literature out of something that I was really interested in um, at the time. And then I picked up, you know, a lot of other books that um, came out of that sort of tradition of immersive journalism. Uh, George Plimpton um, is another example of that. He wrote a ton, uh, you know, um, where he would put himself in these scenarios, often in an athletic context. Um, he did a year call, uh, with the Detroit Lions and then wrote a book called Paper Lion that I also read. And then Friday Night Lights came along. And so that, that was my sort of reading, you know, uh, interest in seventh or eighth grade. Um, and, and it really then, I think, fostered a little bit more attention and, and interest in some of the, you know, more traditional great works that I came across in, in high school, an appreciation for narrative, uh, an appreciation for a turn of phrase. And I would say an appreciation for the depth of story that, you know, went into a lot of the characterization of, you know, some of the people that Talander met. Um, that that summer and a lot of the compassion and celebration of, of those. So um, anyway, I, I think that we would be well served as educators um, to provide students um, reading material, particularly sort of in, in pre-adolescence, adolescence as sort of their minds are you 
and sort of coming to mature for the first time um, as academic beings and uh, critical thinkers um, by, by putting stories that they're interested in them uh, interested in and um, you know uh, letting letting their interest in reading kind of grow from there. Yeah, I think that's an awesome point. Um, I think about it all the time because. You know, I, when I give out books at the beginning of the year and, and choose certain texts that I think are going to be compelling and interesting and are part of the curriculum, and it's not for everyone. Not everyone is going to like every single one of these books, you know, and there should be, I think, I think you're right, there should be more choice in students finding texts that they're compelled by, that they're interested in, because that's how you foster a love for reading. That's how we both you know, we went into the library and chose books that we liked and that spoke to us at the moment we read them. And, you know, I think I remember reading Where the Redfern Grows when I was younger. And that was a, you know, random book, but I loved it. And I loved books about dogs. And I don't love books about dogs now, but it started my love for reading. And that origin story is really important for everybody when they're trying to, to find something that they're interested in when it comes to books. Yeah, I think the question is often, you know, what's the space in which a child likes to play? And and there can be a ton of learning that just comes out of, you know, a recognition and extension of that of that space. Um, the epigraph to this book is by the poet um, G.K. Chesterton, and it's from where the title is drawn. Uh, it is not only possible to say a great deal in praise of play. It is really possible to say the highest things in praise of it. It might reasonably main, be maintained that the true object of all human life is play. Earth is a task garden. Heaven is a playground. And it's like, you know, that that I think is, um, you know, good good medicine for educators and and all that seek to have, um, you know, formative environments for kids. Um, you know, start with where they play, and uh, I think the the learning will follow. Yeah, it's really important. Uh, in the art room, I'm thinking about the art room. You know, when you become a great artist, you have to start with messing around and playing and finding what your style is. And you're not given really an assignment right off the bat. You're just kind of doing your thing. You're doodling, you know. And I think the same can be true for reading. I think the same is true for basketball. You know, you become a bait, great basketball player in the backyard first or a great lacrosse player in the backyard. So I love that message. Well, Bart, thank you very much for uh, for coming in today and joining us on the episode. It was great to catch up with you and see you again. Um, hope everyone is doing well in your in your family and in Pittsburgh. I still have not been to Pittsburgh, and that's another thing that I wanted to ask you about a little bit today was you know Pittsburgh and some of your favorite things to do in that in that city. But hopefully, sometime soon, can get up and, and visit you and, and check out Shady Side. Yeah, you'll, you'll have to pay us a visit, three and a half hours, uh, you know, along uh, Route 70, uh, some some beautiful flat territory, but uh, we, we would love to host you, Jake, at, at Shadyside or, or in Pittsburgh. I'm so appreciative of the opportunity. This is definitely going to be one of the highlights uh, of the year for me to, to be a part of the, the Path to Follow podcast. Um, I had opportunity during my, my tenure at at Gilman to, to get to know Mr. Finney a little bit and, and shared a couple of meals with him. And um, I, I just think the work you're doing is such a wonderful way among so many um, that, that Gilman honors uh, his, his legacy and, um, you know, extends it into the life of the boys that are, that are there today. So, um, and a, a, as a, uh, as someone that first engaged you um, at, at Gilman on zoom, by the way, before zoom was cool, right. That's just true. want a little credit for that. Early adopter. Um, if not for, for for Zoom, there might not have been any Jake uh, at Gilman. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it, it's it's nice full circle to be on the other end of the interview uh, with you now. Whatever it is, five to six years later. That's totally true. I forgot about that. It was a it was a video call the first time we met. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well Bart, well, great. Thank thanks you. to you and Tesseray, and uh, we'll we'll reconnect again soon. Let's do it. Great to see you. Thank you very much again. Thank you. See ya.